Uh, so, uh, hope you all enjoyed your first day of PyCon AU. Um, who, who's going to dinner? Like? Awesome. Most people. That's so really great. Uh, dinner, we will be boarding um, from Rest Point, if that wasn't clear, onto a boat. Uh, we will be gathering at 5.35 outside of Pier 1. If you walk to the other end of the hotel until you see the Onks Bar or the Loft, go down the bottom of the stairs and we'll meet there. Hopefully there will be some volunteers around. If you get lost, any of the staff at Rest Point will know where Pier 1 is, so that won't be a problem. If you don't have a dinner ticket and you expressed interest that you would like one and they wrote your name down at the registration desk, please uh, go back and visit there uh, as soon as Lightning Talks start. It will mean that you miss Lightning Talks, but we need to prepare for the dinner. Uh, so we, can, we might be able to do something for you. If you are no longer coming to the dinner and you have a ticket, uh, if you could please return that to us, it'd be great because we do have very limited numbers. Um, all right, uh, we have a prize to give away. Uh, so it's a random draw. It's the... It's um, a copy of the Python Standard Library by Example by Doug Hellman uh, with thanks to Addison Wesley Publishers. So uh, thanks Indeed. to them for providing it. And who's the winner, Josh? The winner, drum roll, please. <laughs> uh, James Murty, are you here? Uh, yes, Excellent, cool. ah, please come, come on. on down. So uh, Chris will be hosting the Lightning Talks this afternoon. If you don't get a chance to do your Lightning Talk because we don't have time, there'll be more Lightning Talks tomorrow. And uh, if you're a beginner and sort of uh, not really sure about presenting... Cool, thank you. Thank you, sorry. Uh, the, um, if you're a beginner and not really sure about presenting and you'd like a chance to have a go at a Lightning Talk but you don't want to talk in front of everyone, Brianna will be running Lightning Talks tomorrow in her session, and I think at 1.10 in the Port Light Bar. So if you want to send her an email, she emailed the chat list or, or grab her. She stood up this morning. Uh, you can have a chat to her about presenting then. Otherwise, I believe the people who have, um, sorry? See her beforehand. Yeah, see her beforehand if you can. Um, otherwise, the people who have written their name on the board will be going through those and uh, I'll hand over to Chris to do that. And I believe there's um, a good prize in store if we want to announce that. Yes, now. it is. The book itself is getting on in life a bit. It's a copy of the second edition of the Python Cookbook, with thanks to O'Reilly Media, uh, published by one of, uh, sorry, signed by one of the co-editors, Anna Martelli Ravenscroft, who uh, has donated that for us. Um, so, signed book for the winner of the, the Lightning Talks this evening. So, I will take that. Oh, okay, if you want to. Okay, so here's the rules. You're allowed five minutes to present a lightning talk, uh, with or without slides. Uh, the moment that you attempt to connect your laptop to the projector, the timer will start. <laughs> now, we're giving you a bit of an advantage here in that we actually have two lecterns, and both of them can display to the projectors. So, the person who is coming up after the current speaker can connect their laptop to the... Um, can connect their laptop to the other lectern. And Nick Coghlan is being awfully presumptuous in that he thinks I'm going to go in linear order for, uh, from what was written on the, light, uh, on the whiteboards. Uh, he'd be correct. Um, and yes, we'd love some uh, heckling from the audience wherever possible um, and counting down as loudly and as, and as obnoxiously as possible. The timer is in plain sight at the, uh, on the table here. Except for the speaker. Right. <laughs> so, um, how about we take this sign here. See how it says minutes here? Speakers, it says minutes here. Is this going to be seconds, okay? So... Um, Let's go to our first... Uh, we've already got it here. No, that's not fair. <laughs> okay, so our first speaker is Nick Hodge, followed by Nick Coughlin. Uh Time to start. Nick. So, just as well, we have different second names, Nick. Um, so, uh, greetings and salutations. My name is, is Nick Hodge. I work for Microsoft, professional geek. Um, the Wi-Fi is thanks to Windows Azure. And um, the reason why I'm speaking is I don't know, uh, and I hope this isn't too much of an ad. If it is, you can boo me off. Uh, very quickly, for um, our Tech Ed conference that we do every year, we generally capture all of the tweets that happen, and we stick them in a database. And this year, it's my responsibility to do that. Um, as I am 
am a, uh, I do more front end sort of stuff uh, with Windows 8 and dot, uh, .NET and WPF and XAML and HTML and that sort of stuff. Back end stuff, my history is uh, being probably a little bit more Python y than um, and PHP, but I won't go into that. A bit more Python y uh, than .NET. Uh, and the last time I was responsible for this, when I had to do it in .NET, um, I did this in Windows Azure when we were doing platform as a service. So you wrote this .NET application and had lots and lots of lines of code and I ran the app and it worked successfully. Um, but I got a bill for $200, um, which wasn't very pleasant um, to try and explain to the uh, wife why I had to pay $200 for just all these tweets. Anyway, I digress. So what I decided to do this time was um, use the uh, new thingy in uh, Windows Azure where I can make a new virtual machine. Uh, and, um, and normally, again, what I would do if I was building a virtual machine, um, or uh, sorry, uh, doing this on the back end or doing it in Python, is I'd go and buy you know, a hosting server somewhere uh, and, and get a, a, some sort of uh, don't get much control over a Unix environment. Uh, but with, with Azure, now I uh, just ask for a Ubuntu a server uh, and got a, a VM running. And uh, so I can essentially just. Uh, quickly, uh, one of the ports that is automatically opened up is port 22, so you can SSH into it. And as long as I remember the password, I can pass it into this. And actually, the reason why I'm talking and, and uh, is the, 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 the name of my talk was called uh, Crossing the River, mainly because I've named my uh, projects under after bridges across the Rhine, Arnhem, Remagen, and uh, Nijmegen. Um, a little bit of no, I don't think the Megan's across the Rhine. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> uh, uh, but if, if, you're a, if you're a fan of military history, you'll probably get those anyway. Um, what's interesting is that these are, uh, I've written these scripts in uh, Python. I just run them in my little, very minuscule uh, Azure uh, service in a little VM. Uh, and it just uh, populates um, uh, queues and tables, uh, Azure queues and tables to store the stuff uh, using the uh, SDK. Uh, the only add that I'm going to, uh, should show some code here, but uh, that uh, Python code, but that could get a bit dangerous, um, especially if I show the launch codes, because then we'll end up with global thermonuclear war, um, which is not good, evidently. Um, is uh, if you want to know more about this, uh, come and grab a USB from me, and it's got the URL on the uh, back of it. Um, and as this is slightly an ad, I'm actually not going to take, take up all the time um, and um, hand over to Nick. Thank you. I really hate it when we don't get an opportunity to boo presenters off stage. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, um, the people on this side tend not to be able to see the presenters unless they sit where they're meant to. Um, we're swapping that around for the lightning talks. You people over here might not be able to see the presenter this time, just to keep things fair and equitable. Uh, here's a microphone for you, Nick. Uh, up next, I think, is Dylan Jay. So if you can um, yeah, connect your laptop up here uh, while we're going, and then pop, pop off the stage where possible. And your time starts now. Ah. Uh, it's on the wrong screen. Um, uh, it's backwards. That'll do. You get my version. Um, so yeah, Python 3.3 in five minutes. Sorry about the size. I got the, sli the screens back to front. What? What? Okay, uh, Python 3.3 in four minutes, since both Richard and I told each other to submit a talk and neither of us did. Um, so Python 3.3 is uh, third release of the Python 3 series. Um, it's the first one where we haven't been developing two feature branches in parallel. So feature development kind of took off compared to 3.2. Um, so there's some interesting language features coming. Uh, if, who likes virtual env? So virtualenv has some hacks in it to work around the fact that the core doesn't support it. So in Python 3.3, vnv is a native virtualenv implementation. Uh, virtualenv itself will still work, but vnv basically gets to avoid some of the hacks. Uh, in 3.3, virtualenv will similarly be able to take advantage of that native support. Uh, who likes empty init.py files? 3.3, <laughs> you don't need them anymore. You just need a directory. 
You can have as many directories in a package as you like. It will pick up all of them on sys.path. Um, you can do this now with a bunch of hackery in your init.py files. 3.3, uh, it'll just do it automatically. Um, who uses generators? Who gets annoyed at the fact that farming a section of a generator out to a different generator is a pain? <laughs> so 3.3, uh, you can just write yield from some other generator, uh, and it will all work, including send and throw. Um, and it basically brings generators up to full uh, equivalence with functions in terms of splitting chunks of them out. Um, who likes checking Erno values to figure out what exactly went wrong with an OS operation? Uh, Python 3.3 has a completely reworked OS hierarchy. Uh, you can actually catch file not found error. You can catch is a directory error. You can catch is not a directory error. Um, and yeah, see the pep or the 3.3 what's new for details. Um, one of the awesome features in Python 3 is that exceptions are chained by default. So if you have a bug in an error handler, you will see in the default traceback both the original bug and the one in the error handler, and you'll be able to see everything. Sometimes you actually do really want to replace an exception, like turning a key error into an attribute error. Um, 3.3 has the syntax to actually do that. Uh, standard library. If you've ever tried to use the standard library's support for passing and manipulating IP addresses, you'll have realized it doesn't have any. <laughs> um, that changes in 3.3. We've got a cleaned up version of uh, IP address, which actually follows standard network semantics rather than the interesting interpretation IP address has. Uh, LZMA commission in the core, uh, all sorts of new POSIX APIs, um, especially a bunch to do with resisting symlink attacks, uh, all sorts of stuff there. Um, for a long time, a pain with doing timeouts and benchmarking is that the timing interfaces change depending on what platform you're on. Uh, there's now cross-platform ones such that you can say I'm doing timeouts or I'm doing benchmarking and it, you can just use the right API. Fault handle module, if you've ever been hit by a seg fault in a C extension and it just says stopped and tells you nothing, uh, if you enable the fault handle module in 3.3, it will actually give you a traceback. It won't give you a full traceback because the interpreter is in a weird state, but it'll try. Uh, if you've ever used uh, Michael Ford's mock module for unit testing, that's now in the standard library. Um, 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, I got through a lot of these slides, didn't I? Um, the memory view, which was added quite some time ago in 3.3 can do full multi-dimensional arrays, including all the, most of the NumPy goodies. And datetime objects finally have a timestamp method. <laughs> 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven. And you can use U literals again. Four, three, two, <laughs> yep, sure. Now, when I said earlier that you know you need to make sure that um, you know that that your stuff is ready to go when I tell you to, like because I would start the timer early. Um, yeah, I, w I actually meant that. So you should actually like test to see whether or not your projector is going to display the right thing uh, while you're testing as well. Um, so um, it's now time for Dylan Jay followed by Russell Keith McGee. So there's your microphone, and your time starts now. Okay, so uh, I prepared this last night. I was in this discussion. It's not it's not too Pythonic, but uh, we were kind of discussing uh, uh, this, and it's it's kind of cool for people who run big websites. It's kind of interesting to hear about. So uh, my name's Dylan. I'm from a company called PredoWeb. We do mostly Plone stuff. It's Python. Uh. Okay. Yeah. So. We do mostly government stuff, blah, 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 intranets, some interesting secure sites. Uh, so uh, Victorian SES, they put out a tender, what they wanted. They wanted a CMS. Uh, they wanted a multi-site CMS, which Plone is good for. They wanted something that was quite secure, so good. Uh, they wanted a theme themselves, which they did. Uh, and most importantly was they wanted to, to work in a disaster. Uh, I don't know anyone who doesn't. People know about four nines reliability. Um, it basically means four and a half minutes 
uh, outage. Uh, and there's a good reason they want. I don't know if you heard of the country fire service and how that kind of fell to bits during the Black Sunday. So they're kind of concerned about this stuff. Uh, and so we said we'd do it for them. Uh, that's what the website looks like. Uh, so the architecture is kind of interesting. We, there's a lot of kind of layers of back down in there. We've, uh, it's, it's, it's mostly served through a CDN, but we've also backups with uh, uh, things like uh, Varnish. Varnish has nice things like grace period. So if any particular little bit of the thing uh, goes down, it's still going to serve something and give some information. Um, what's interesting about that is it's, it's got database replication, geo redundancy, and neither of which is in Victoria, which is quite important if a tsunami comes and hits Victoria. Uh, one of the nice things about this was the uh, Plone has this built-in case management, so we can do some really things that are really, really easy. We can do things like 60 minute, 60 second caches, which we did. Uh, on lots of pages, which is uh, how you make something like this scale, because things like Amazon and uh, and IS and stuff doesn't work when you need to scale up in seconds. Uh, so a big point in this was load testing. Um, I think there was a talk earlier where they talked about funk load. Funk load is really cool. Uh, it can't test to this level, but we tried it uh, and and did some some cool stuff with it. Um, it uses web unit and the automated distributed stuff so you can uh, farm it out to lots of machines and then get back the results. Very cool. Um, I, uh, I tried it with G-Event as well to see if it'll go faster. That was kind of interesting. Got different results back. I've got to try that again. Uh, so we, we used uh, SAS JMeter. Also it doesn't work because uh, most of those are in the US so you end up with pipes being the problem. So in the end we, uh, we actually got the host to do it and they reconfigured their network in order to generate the amount of load. So the amount of load is really interesting. This is what we're trying to predict, right? It's 840,000 people in 15 minutes getting on their iPhones, looking at it after a major earthquake. An earthquake happens at the same time. Everyone gets the same signal, and the first thing they're going to do is jump and look for the word earthquake. Uh, so that was prediction. It ends up being 21 gigabits, and they built a rather large page in the end. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's basically becoming like ebay.com in, in 10 seconds. <laughs> so you don't expect to actually uh, have this tested, but in a couple of months after going live, they actually had an earthquake. Uh, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, uh, and that's what it looks like. That is, the, that is the curve from an earthquake. You can see that they don't get a lot of traffic normally. And then you get an awful lot of traffic. And, and this kind of secondary one is kind of interesting. I'm, I'm guessing that's news reports coming out on TV and people jumping on the internet at that point. Um, so this is the, the cool bit. This is the analytics. This is our downtime. Uh, so th there's the big spike in traffic, and uh, we really don't change uh, our server response time. Uh, <laughs> The bad point about this is that uh, that got widely, widely reported, and no one reported the fact that the SES site stayed up. Uh, and Google took advantage of this to say, wouldn't it be good if this stuff, like emergency sites, was hosted on Google, and they got a press release out of it, and yeah. anyway. <laughs> 30 seconds. Okay, that's it. Oh. <laughs> okay. So who have we got after Russell? We have Cody Lovett. So if you could come and set up on this machine, uh, set your laptop to 1024 by 768, and I will go get this mic over to you. Thank you. And your time starts now, now-ish. Okay. It should be up. Yeah, okay. Uh, hi. Uh, so my name is Russell Keith McGee. I'm a Django core developer, president of the Django Software Foundation. But why I'm here today is not necessarily related to that, or at least not directly. Um, I'm here to talk about Myob and Quicken and Xero, oh my, all these things that we kind of have to deal with. Um, accounting isn't fun. I don't know anyone that enjoys accounting except accountants who get paid to work on accounting. Um, but unfortunately, we all need to do it anyway. Um, how many people here have done e-commerce sites or built, built an e-commerce site? How many of them are doing it for customers that actually have a business and they want to sell this stuff online? And they, like the, the online is just part of their business. How many of those customers have an accounting system that is offline? Right, that's the problem that I, I need to tackle as well. I have myself a, a, an online, a startup business uh, called, uh, called tradescloud.com. Most of what we do has nothing to do with accounting. It's logistics for small trades, plumbers, electricians, that sort of thing. 
But part of what we do is we have to generate invoices. And then the invoices have to turn up in MyOp. And as hard as we try, we cannot convince our customers to use Xero because they're plumbers and whatnot, and they're, they're, it's a really big step for them to use a cloud service at all, let alone convince their accountant to also use a cloud service. So I'm in a situation where I want very, very badly to make them use a web service, but I can't. And what I want to do is be able to build a system that sits offline, talks to MyOb, because MyOb does have little back channels, you can get information into it, but then treat it as an actual web service to have effectively MyOb posting to a web URL that it's under my control or anyone else's for that matter, so that all of the invoice information that I'm generating can turn up in the customer's uh, uh, MyOb setup, or all of the customers that they're generating on online turn up in their MyOb setup, or all the payments they're registering on their MyOb setup turn up in our accounts. This is not a system that I have built, it is a system that we are going to have to build, but we want to do it open source. Regardless of what the reaction is to this in this room, we are probably going to do this anyway and we're going to turn it into an open source project, release the code. We have found a person who's going to, who can, knows MyOb's internals, knows Quicken's internals and is going to build this for us. What I'm looking for is anyone else in this room that has a similar problem and is interested in getting involved in trying to make this happen, come and talk to me because if you've got resources you could possibly throw at this, if you've got people you could throw at this, if you've got money you could throw at this, we can help distribute this load. Our intention is to open source it anyway, but if you didn't get involved then it means that we can share the load and every, the ideal behind open source is that everybody contributes a little bit, nobody has to contribute a lot, and we end up with a working project that everybody likes. So, I figure I'm not the only person in the world that hates mild with a fiery passion but absolutely has to work with it. Um, this is the call for participation. If you are interested in this, come and talk to me. I'll be at the dinner tonight. I'm at the conference tomorrow. I'm at the sprints on Monday. Uh, or you can catch me online. I'm Russell at KeithMcGee.com. I'm Freakboy3742 on <laughs> Twitter. Uh, or I'm SessiNespa.com uh, on the web. Um, and yeah, so please come and talk to me because I very badly want to make this problem go away. And I think we could make make the transition for people who don't like using cloud services a lot easier by showing them that we can make all this stuff a cloud service transparently by letting them use their existing systems as a cloud service. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Hello. Hello. Is this working? Great, it is. Uh, thanks, Russell. Uh, up next we have Cody Lovett and um, Michaela Ledwidge is on next. Uh, here is your microphone. And your time starts now. Hi, I'm Cody Lovett. I'm 15 years old and I've been programming in Python for a couple of years now. So this talk is about a 3D fractal terrain generator that I made recently. And so this is it. So first you choose what the world size is. I like 512. <laughs> and so Basically, six recursions is the fastest with the best quality. And so this is what it is. Basically, the white is high and the black is low. So then you can actually see like there's a bit of a valley and then there's some mountains on the side. So basically the way it works is I start with these four points on the sides and then what I do is I basically they are square and so then I put a point between each one of those and one in the middle and then each of these points moves up and down by a random amount and so then you can see there's four squares and then I put one between each of those points and more in the middle and I keep on doing that until I have a lot of points and a lot of numbers and then I put them together to display the image. So here's the code. Basically what it is is just sets up all the stuff. These are the first four points and then it finds if the then it goes through every x and y point and it find, first it finds if they're already at a point under that name and then if there isn't it finds if where the nearest points are, then gets the averages, and then draws it. So here's one I prepared earlier. This is 512 by 512 and a resolution of 9. And th 
this is what it looks like. And this is just the drawing code. This is nothing to do with anything else, just it drawing all the pixels. And that takes a while, so it took like a whole day just to work out all the points. So this is actually pretty cool because it's really smooth and you can see like high bits and the low bits, bit of a cliff there. And yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so up next we have Michaela Ledwidge and next is uh, Josh Bartlett. Yeah, so if you can come set up on this one and you can start. Um, uh, have you plugged in the video? Um, yeah, you need to maybe just detect your displays. Uh. Yeah, I might start the timer. <laughs> Boo, hiss, yeah, 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 support from the crowd, that's great. Support from the crowd, um, I'll start it again. Yeah. I love the way Mac just makes the um, display thing disappear when you... Um, the detect display disappears, but anyway. Um, look, if this doesn't start up, I can do it without slides, but hopefully it will work. It seems to be doing something. Um, look, I just want to talk about an idea and give you a little bit about, because you know, we've got silos in our, in our business, don't we? I'm an artist, I'm an entrepreneur. I want to talk to you about the live coding scene, and it doesn't look like the slides there. Yep, oh, cool, excellent. All right, let's try again. So I want to talk to you about the live coding scene. And um, basically, there's not much going on with Python, but I think there could be. So there's a question here. The idea is live coding. That's what it is if you don't know about it. I'm going to tell you about the community, the software, and leave you with a question. So why is it that there are so few open films out there? But just so happens that the best examples are made in Python. Blender produced films like Big Buck Bunny. There's no Australian content out there, but Mod Productions, my company, is working on it. This is what the aim of the talk is, to tell you that about there is a community for people who do live coding. There are various tools that are designed for live coding performances, but they tend to use languages like Scheme. So could Python perhaps be the live coding platform? We saw IPython this morning. Uh, all the major post-production tools used in Hollywood and the film industry have Python APIs. Uh, Touch Designer, which is the real-time engine I use for large um, vi interactive video installations, is threatening to have a Python API soon, which will be great. This is the kind of projects we're working on to explore this space. If you're interested in this topic, if you're looking for media to play with with your, um, with your programs, come and talk to me. Working with the Australian uh, Chamber Orchestra, we learned that it's great having Django apps on set because if you're trying to do real-time performances, interactive visuals of live performances and you're doing something like a 13-camera stereo shoot, um, it's really helpful to have a web app on, on set to check the camera data is, is working um, faster than the data operators. So we're sitting on all of this data. We've got our little custom Django apps for managing all the data in the cloud. Um, and I'm looking for developers to play with it. We don't have much budget for hiring people, but open content is one of the things we explore. We've also got a social mobile game, looking for Pythonistas who are interested in playing with a, a geo treasure hunt game around finding photographs. All sorts of opportunities to slurp in data from your favourite social network and also perform on top of it. Um, almost bring back the live immediacy of Dungeons and Dragons, remember all that. Uh, another, um, and this is, this is my pet project, which some of you may have heard me talk about over the years at SciPy. Um, I've been working on an interactive sci-fi story universe, which is essentially participatory cinema. We've got over a terabyte of Creative Commons cleared um, media assets from a 35 millimeter film production um, about seven years ago. And the whole idea is having a rock solid API to high-end cinema. Still working on it. Project's been going um, for many, many years. But if you're looking for something that's you know above you know a few graphs and a couple of images, we've got some really cool content and we'll love to play more with Python people. So if any of this tickles your fancy, um, there's some Twitter thingies. Thanks for your time. Okay, so up next we have Josh Bartlett. And uh, which mic was it that you just put down? Is it this one? Is that coming out of that speaker over there? No, it's not. Hmm. I'm going to take that one away from the table. Uh, and up next is Ryan Kelly. So if you can set up on this one, that would be great. Here's your microphone. Um, and your time starts now. 
Have I got that switched across to this laptop now? No, nothing is coming through. Let's go, new terminal. Actually, can I have someone, uh, Nick, can you come and hold the microphone for me? I have to at least pretend I'm typing. <laughs> but we can't see your screen. I'll work on that first. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be really hey! Hey! Yes! Why is it that the GUI doesn't work and XRANDA does? All right, so. Because Can you hold the down. microphone for me, please? Um, so I enjoy learning new things at um, these conferences, and so I'm going to teach you about descriptors. For those of you who don't knew, know, this will be fun. For those of you who do know, it's only five minutes, so it's not a huge <laughs> waste of your time. All right, so four minutes, sorry, my bad, only three and a half minutes, so not a huge waste of your time. So that is not doing... Increase my font size. Can you see that? Yeah. Can you read that? All right, so if I have a class... We will call it A, and it's going to have an attribute, and it's going to have a function, and see, I'm pretending to type. All right, so <laughs> I have an object called A. Um, now, this is all well and good. We know what A is. We know what A.name is. We know what A.run is. It's a bound method. As you expect, A equals A, A.name equals A.name, uh, A.run equals A.run. Excellent. A is A. Good. Things are behaving the way they should be. A dot run is A dot run. Whoa, false. A dot run is not A dot run. What can be going on here? Oh, run one equals A dot run one. Uh, A dot run. Run two equals A dot run. Look, this method has a different ID from itself. What can be going on? So, enter the descriptor. A descriptor is basically just any object that has some special methods. Here's a get method. This is called any time this attribute is tried to be accessed. So um, it gets what object it's accessed on and what class it's accessed on. I'm going to define a set method that does nothing and a delete method that, oh, let's see, raise value, name error. I do not know what you are talking about. OK, so to use a descriptor, I define a class with thingy equals this descriptor. Uh, here's b. Okay, so we have this B object, B dot thingy. Oh, it's a string. That's interesting. I thought it was a descriptor. B dot thingy equals seven. Now, you notice that I set, the set method actually does nothing, so B dot thingy is still the same string. Um, let's delete B dot thingy. Oh, I do not know what you are talking about. Looks like magic. What about capital B dot thingy on the class? Oh, look, it's a different string. So the descriptor can know whether it's being accessed on the class or on the instance. What if I subclass b? b one dot thingy. Look, it knows what subclass it's being accessed on. All right, so I can actually access the real thingy here using, so you probably can't see that at the bottom there, b dot dictive thingy. Um, and this is what is used for methods. So we go back to our original example. a dot run is a dot run. No, it is not. a dot run is a bound method. Class a dot run is an unbound method. A dot dict of run is a function. That's interesting. Let's have a look at this function. A dot dict run. Oh, look, we have this thing called uh, magic method here called get, if I can find it there. Here it is, get. So this is acting as a descriptor. When you try and get this on the instance, it will give you a method back. Um, this is actually also how properties work and how just about everything in Django works. So um, <laughs> this is my uh, crash course for you in descriptors. For those of you who don't know, I hope that you've learned something new about Python. And everyone, please thank our fantastic mic stand, Nick Coughlin. <laughs> He's okay. for the next session as well. Ooh, fantastic. And for the dinner? Um, up next is Tim Nugent, so if you can come set up. Um, and Ryan, it's time for you to start uh, now. Thanks.
So hi, I'm Ryan. I love talking about Python stuff and that last talk was actually a brilliant segue into this one um, because one of the things that I, I find really effective when you're giving a talk about technical stuff um, can be to actually drop down into a terminal and give a demo of the code or the tool or the API that you're interacting with. Um, unfortunately, my hands seem to work about five times faster than my brain. So if I tried to drop down and do something like that live, I would just be constantly typing gibberish onto the screen. Um, so code demos and this sort of thing, very cool idea. Trying to do that live, I've found is a terrible idea. Um, so now I need Nick to come back and hold the mic for me. Um, so there are a couple of um, tools that you can do to do bits and pieces of this, like um, Unix comes with a tool called Script that can record a terminal session and play it back for you. Uh, there's a Python tool called Player Piano, but I found neither of them, uh, none of them really met my needs completely. So I wrote a new one and named it after a misquotation of a famous movie. Um, so we have this command, good. Um, play it again, Sam. It has a record mode, and you basically write out data into a file. I run that, it drops me into a shell, um, and then I might, you know, go into Python. And this is actually is live, which is why I'm doing all these typos. Um, you know, I can uh, list my directory. I might get into Vim and muck around in here or do whatever I need to do. Um, I can also open up another console um, and join an existing recording session um, and do other interesting stuff in there. And when I close out of all of these, you'll find I've got this demo.js file, which is a log of all of the things that I just did. Like I opened a terminal, I waited for a bit, some stuff got spat out, you know, I, I entered this, this was output and so forth. And then I can actually play that back. Uh, .js. Um, and it will let me type in random garbage and play back what I have on the screen. But if I keep typing past the end of a line, it'll wait for me to realize what I'm doing and hit enter. Um, so it kind of looks like I'm interacting with stuff, but not really. Um, <laughs> which is quite cool. And it pops up another terminal for me because I opened a new one. Da, da, da. All right, so that's pretty cool. Um, one thing that you may have thought is that JSON is a pretty weird format for this sort of what is essentially binary terminal output data. Um, and you're not wrong, but you haven't been introduced to uh, this awesome pure JavaScript VT100 terminal emulator, um, which I didn't write. I got from uh, a project called Shell in a Box, which is pretty awesome. But I did add a bunch of code around it to basically orchestrate a very similar set of interactions um, right here in the middle of my slideshow. And for me, this is uh, you know, the best of both worlds. I can have uh, an interactive demo that I can't screw up, and I also don't have to leave the context of my presentation um, and forget to switch back and forth across desktops or anything like that. And as you can see, it pops up a new console. I've got all my colors and my interactions and so forth in there. Um, and that's pretty cool. So, except that I keep wanting to switch to the desktop because I'm used to doing it the old way. <laughs> um, so if you want to hack around on this stuff, um, the Python uh, recorder and player is on GitHub. The JavaScript player is on GitHub. Um, and yeah, I think it's pretty cool. I'm going to hopefully use it for more presentations in the future. And if you'd like to try it out, yeah, come hack with me. Thanks. OK. So. Um I did have on the board a couple of time permitting slots. It doesn't look like we're going to have time for those, so we'll make those the first two uh, for tomorrow. Um, our final presenter for today is Tim, and I'm utterly terrified about at what is about to happen. Yeah, I'm planning on it. Uh, start. Um, okay, so this is actually the first time I've given a lightning talk where Chris hasn't got the sense of the slides. Uh, so it should be kind of interesting. So my talk is called The Secret Life of Pi. I called it that so Chris knew I wasn't calling it. PyCon is in trouble. Um, now, you're probably wondering, why is PyCon in trouble? It seems to be going pretty well. The problem is, it's being run by a madman. Um, I'm pretty sure this is self-evident from the fact he likes to start it before people get to talk. I'm sure if he had some way of electrocuting us, he probably would. This madman, however, is called Chris, if you didn't know. He's your conference organizer. Now, as proof of his madness, let's go to Twitter. He has Twitter. I have Twitter. So a few months ago, I was looking at Pi PyCon and going, hey, this seems a bit weird. Babies have to pay $10 to go to the dinner, but they don't get to eat anything. What's up with that? So Chris then goes, you know, Tim, you're an idiot. You didn't read the whole thing. Like, He's probably right. I probably am an idiot. And I didn't read the whole thing, but who cares? So I go, so what? If a parent walks, they get a discount? 
He's like, well, if they walk, they're going to get there late. It's like, well, who cares? So this goes back and forth for a little while. I mean, it just keeps getting weirder and weirder and weirder. And then eventually, I, of course, you know, being the troll I am, go back to, so what's with this baby issue? You know, we, we've got a problem here. And Chris, of course, responds, you know, there is no issue. I mean, you can already see the cracks forming. The man's a little bit crazy. He's snapping. He's not being very respective to me as a person. That's when Paris here, our coffee sponsor, decides to jump in. He goes, you know, maybe, maybe Elon Musk is, is sponsoring. $10 for that would be pretty good. If you don't know, he's the guy who runs SpaceX. Uh, I think $10 to go into space would be awesome. Uh, to which, of course, you know, means I've got to keep this trolling. This keeps going on and on and on. And after a while... Uh, I start getting the feeling that Chris isn't actually responding to me. It's as almost as if he, he's not answering. So I, of course, throw this out to the Twitter sphere and go, hey, Twitter, what do you think's happening here? To which I get Robert Wallhead going, damn it, you know, that was so much fun. We're getting great information. It's great feedback. Chris is such an evil turd, you know, skipping up. <laughs> uh, and I don't think it was. I mean, I, I was part of the conversation, Frank. Um, so, you know, I, I, of course, you know, throw down the gauntlet to which Chris... To which Chris tries to, to which Chris tries to pick it up, uh, but he says, you know, they aren't really gaps. Uh, I'm just a little bit insane. Hello, microphone. Oh, it's good, 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 good. So this is Chris essentially going, bam! You've lost him. Give up. You're not going back. <laughs> Never mind. Paris comes back in. He's going, well, we're going into space. I can't wait for it. Uh, to which Chris, this is where it starts getting crazy. He goes, it's okay. We'll cremate you. I'm like, ha ha ha. That's that's a that's a good once off. <laughs> So I'm like, yeah, that's funny, Chris. So we're actually going into space. You're not going to kill us. So I ask, of course, you know, what about the babies? Do the babies get to go into space? They have their $10. He's like, this is where it gets even weirder. They get a separate urn. Uh, I'm like, well, 10 bucks for an urn seems a little bit tacky. I've been to funerals. They're expensive. I don't think 10 bucks would get you much more than like an old Milo tin. Uh, so I go, what's on? He's like, it's okay. He'll do the cremation. He'll organise the whole thing. So at this stage, I'm actually a little bit scared. I'm sort of like, holy crap, Chris is going to grind the entire conference up into some sort of cremated pace, shoot us into space and then laugh at us. Um, which I think is pretty sure, you know, nails down the fact that Chris is insane. The man's nuts. Unfortunately, so are his minions. Uh, so Josh is another person helping with the conference. Josh is insane. You can tell. Matt is insane. Pip is insane. Mark is insane. Winton is insane. The rest are probably all insane too, but they weren't stupid enough to let me get a picture of them. Or the only pictures I had, they looked a little bit aroused, which <laughs> kind of scared me a little bit. But that's when I realised that they, they're not insane. They're just stressed. I mean, you know, they've got to organise this whole, you know, whole conference. A lot of stuff going on there. At least I hope they're just stressed. I mean, I hope Chris isn't really planning to grind me into a paste and then shoot me into space. Um, so I'd just like to say thanks, guys. Uh, two thumbs up for doing a good job with the conference overall. Uh, also, thanks to Paris for all the pictures. I stole them. Uh, and even though we're not allowed to do advertising, I'm going to break that rule. Uh, I'm just going to say, if you are planning a conference, may I suggest you buy Chris? Get him to plan your conference. He is a little bit insane, but I mean, you know, when it comes down to it, you get something good at the end. I think we'd all think we've gotten something good out of this. So that's my talk, and uh, thank you. Right. Hello? Is this mic on? Can you hear me? Yes, great. Okay, so dinner is pretty soon now. Now, for the majority of you, there will be a boat departing outside Pier 1. Tim, your transport will depart from the tower in about five minutes' time. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, from 5.30 onwards at the base of the stairs... Oh. <laughs> Oh, that was actually that was actually Tim's timer, so yeah. Right, so right. Can I say anything? I think I'm pretty safe to talk now. Calm down, Frank. Calm down. Um, Right, so from 5.30, 5.35-ish at the base of the stairs um, near Pier 1, um, gather there, uh, the boat boarding will finish for the boat at 5.45. If you are not there, you will not get on the boat, you will not get to dinner, there is no alternative transport. Uh, so see you there soon and be there promptly, please. Uh, thank you all for coming along today and see you tomorrow or at the...